Good morning from our world headquarters in New York. I'm Manis Cranny. And from our studios in London, I'm Danny Berger. Welcome to Bloomberg Brief. Let's set your agenda. President Biden speeds up military assistance via full support for Israel. The world remains on escalation alert as missiles are fired from Lebanon. Treasury yields post some of their biggest single-day declines of 2023. As a host of Fed speakers boost expectations that the central bank is likely done raising rates. We're live in Morocco as the IMF meetings ramp up against a backdrop of escalating global conflict and debt distress. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen spoke earlier. Um, I'm not saying that a soft landing is an absolutely sure thing, but I do continue to think it's the most likely uh, path. But are there risks to um, this outcome? Of course there are, and global shocks are among them. Janet Yellen, though, speaking in the past hour, a number of factors have come to light. She still sees a soft landing, but the moves in the bond market over the past hour are perhaps what the market is most interested in. Equities, for the moment, remain in the green. By the way, you are looking at green across the screen. S&P 500 is up. That drop in yields has given permission for money to flow further into equities, even if you have your doubts about what's coming down the pike. We'll hear from the Fed the minutes a little bit later on today. Maybe the narrative from that will be about growth. I can tell you this, Europe had its best day of 2023, up 2%. Uh, yesterday, we carry through on that. But again, this soft landing is the playthrough for the US equities. Louis Vuitton will be at the bottom of your screen. What you're going to see there is a stock which has wiped out 2023 gains. Why? Wine and booze, that component of LVMH has tanked by 14%. So so there is this concern within the rich sphere or the aspirant luxury that you're running out of breath. So it's a reality check on the sales disappointment. It's one of the biggest laggards in Europe and Asia. Asia has had five days of a winning streak. That's the best streak of 2023. But Barclays make the point that it is going to be resilient earnings that help you find a floor in these equity markets. Danny, good morning. Good morning, Manis. And here I was thinking that booze was recession proof. Look, you mentioned the bond yields coming in, helping the equity market. Let me show you them. U.S. 10-year yields now down more than more than nine and a half basis points. It happened over the past two hours, perhaps helped by the liquidity of the European Open. Fears of escalation as rockets come from Lebanon into Israel. More Israeli Air Force strikes coming into all of that resulting in this haven bid. Brent, though, that did turn around. That had started this morning with gains that drops by about a quarter of 1%. Gold, that haven bid clearly coming in. Same movement happened the same time we saw the bid coming into treasuries. Gold is up by half a percent, lingering around the top levels of the month. Now, Mana, some quick facts on your 10-year yield. It's down about 23 basis points from the peak. And at the same time, we've gone to 60% odds pricing that we will not get get a rate hike come December. But then you get warnings like from Citi saying that the term premium will move higher, the economy is resilient, and there's a lot of supply. Yeah, we've pivoted from, what, a 60% probability of a rate hike last week to 60% probability of a hold in December. It is about debt dynamics yes. to a certain extent. You have this huge move in Treasuries because of the war in Israel and because of peak Fed speak, that rhetoric coming through uh, from Logan, from Jeffries, uh, and again from Daly talking about a new neutral rate, more of that in a moment. The IMF warn about the debt dynamics as being unfavorable, and they talk about an unsustainable uh, situation in the debt dynamics of the U.S. So that's the state of play with the IMF. More uh, readout from Yellen and the IMF meetings later in the show. Well, President Biden is urging Congress to take action on Israel. He spoke at the White House yesterday. When Congress returns, we're going to ask them to take urgent action to fund the national security requirements of our critical partners. The United States has also enhanced our military force posture in the region to strengthen our deterrence. And we stand ready to move in additional assets as needed. Joining us now, let's bring in our head of Middle East and North Africa, Stuart Livingston Wallace. Stuart, good to have you with us uh, to dissect this. Um, who are likely the peace brokers. It's interesting. I would have thought it was Egypt, but it looks as if uh, Qatar may well be in the framework of trying to deliver some kind of an off-ramp. Your assessment so far. Good morning. Good afternoon. 
Good morning, Manus. Uh, yeah, I mean, Qatar got involved very early on in this process. So as we understand it as early as Saturday, that was focused on what do we do about the hostage situation. Uh, there's an unknown number of hostages obviously still being held in Gaza. And given the troop buildup now around the border, the number of reservists that are being called up, there is a growing sense that we might be building up towards a ground war. Uh, again, in a scenario where you have hostages on the ground, that is of deep concern. Uh, what's not clear so far is what success they might have had. Uh, obviously, we're on day five now. There's no sign yet uh, that we're going to get a resolution on that front. I would say the second element to think about is we've got Blinken coming into the region. He's going to be in several countries over the next days. But again, it's hard to know what he might be able to bring with him, bring to bear on the situation, uh, given the events of Saturday and then obviously into Sunday as well. Uh, and the, the, the level of the casualties that we've seen, it's going to be very difficult, I think, to broker a peace here as such. Uh, in addition to that, you've got military assets moving into the region. You're starting to get a build-up coming from southern Lebanon. Uh, it's a very volatile situation. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it is horrific at this point, Stuart. And, and, and as you mentioned, there's the fear of what comes from Hez Hezbollah out of Lebanon, the Iranian-backed group. We did learn moments ago, Hezbollah saying, or Lebanon saying, that they did hit an Israeli military post with guided missiles. What is your assumption about further escalation, given that development? I mean, I think it's a risk, and I, you can't help but think that the U.S. very clearly and publicly signaling that it was moving military assets to the eastern Mediterranean uh, was, in, in some sense, a very clear deterrence, don't get involved. Uh, however things pan out. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you've seen the population in southern Lebanon start to move out of those areas. You know, this is not an organized evacuation. This is people taking it upon themselves to get out of the area, uh, you know, given uh, what's happened over the last several years there. So again, you're getting a sense of a build-up in that area. So far, uh, the rocket attacks have been relatively low level. We did get something of an incursion yesterday into territory held by Israel. But again, nothing on the level that we saw over the weekend in the south. Yeah, well, we certainly heard from Erdogan as well in, in regards to these warships being deployed. He, he warns that the U.S. move could lead to massacres. So, uh, as you say, Stuart, day five uh, and a great many unknowns from hostages uh, to the overall uh, potential for a ground invasion. Stuart Livington, Wal Livingston Wallace, uh, Bloomberg head of Middle East and North Africa. San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly says the neutral rate may be higher now than before the pandemic, but won't be as much as 5%. She spoke at an event yesterday. I completely could imagine that we go from 2.5, anywhere between 2.5 and 3 as the nominal neutral in the go forward. But that's 50 basis points, not, you know, two and a half basis points and 250 basis points. Joining us now is Ella Hoya, head of fixed income at Newton Investment Management. Ella, thank you so much for joining. Look, at the moment, the market seems to be fixated on daily and others saying the market's done our work for us. But there she is talking about a higher neutral rate. Mm -hmm. Should we be thinking about the Fed targeting a higher inflation target at that moment? Is that where the conversation needs to shift to? Potentially. I think some of the attribution to the steepening in the curve at the very long end has been down to the fact that markets think in this cycle the Fed may not get to where it needs to to control inflation so there is some assumption they will allow a little bit more inflation that's been uh, typically the norm say over the last 10 plus years very hard to say at this juncture it's going to depend really how risky assets behave if indeed we do enter more of a recessionary period next year mm. Ella, good morning. And you are wary of risk assets and you have some salutary warnings about 2024. But I want to deal with the bond market right now. As Danny said, we're down over 20, 20, 25 pips from the high. We've seen this quite accentuated move on war and Fed rhetoric. What I'm trying to assess is whether this move is something significant and structural, believing the Fed, or is it all down to war and the reaction to the fog of war? 
It's usually more than one factor driving these types of moves. Uh, you could also argue that markets had gotten quite short, certainly on the more fast type money, CTA positioning, we were quite extremely short, so very vulnerable to a rally. Uh, we've had two months of a sell-off in rates and, uh, you know, with very good momentum, so it's quite natural to expect some uh, pause to that move. Of course, the, you know, the news um, out of Israel um, and the Gaza Strip is certainly being more supportive of rates, but also probably what put the nail on the coffin is, is this comments from the Fed, which would breathe a sigh of relief for markets given everything is so much dependent on where this terminal rates argument goes. So absolutely. I, I guess what I'm also trying to understand, Ella, is have we reached the ceiling yet? If we have this relief maybe coming <laughs> from the Fed, the haven bit, does that right. mean we've already topped out? Well, you're asking, uh, you know, a fixed in income investor if we've peaked in rates. And we could we could argue yes, uh, certainly because of the way risky assets were behaving as curves were pricing higher and sort of bear steepening move. Uh, so it is our view that even if we haven't properly reached that peak, we're not that far from it. So we're closer to the peak, as we said last time we were on the show. Um, however, you know, from an asymmetry perspective, bonds do look interesting here, right? Because it, there's more ways to make money than lose money in fixed income right now certainly on the core government side. And so to us, that looks like closer to a peak argument. Mm. But you are wary, as I said, you, you set out your stall, you are wary of 2024, and you also have a warning flag up over credit. Uh, you warn that uh, this is where you get some carry, but little downside protection. Where are you most worried about in credit? We've got the, we've got the corporate bond spreads uh, in the GTV library for you. Are you more worried about Europe or US? Where am I least protected? Right. Um, generally speaking, high yield markets, so the riskier buckets, there's quite a bit of idiosyncratic moves even within the high yield basket, but also in investment grade space, you're starting to see sort of the quality names uh, demanding uh, less premium in terms of, of yield uh, relative to sort of the more riskier names. So the market's already telling you that it's getting a little bit more nervous. And if you think about the moves that we got in, in spreads, so both in IG and high yield space, over the last uh, say two weeks, you unwound at least six months worth of rally uh, for the year. So it tells you the market is quite sensitive. Uh, so I would say the riskier buckets to begin with and sort of the more uh, risky names, mm -hmm. um, less risky in the short maturities in investment grades, certainly in the high quality names, but mm -hmm. still some pressure there as well. There's this really great research from uh, Bloomberg Quant team's uh, Steve Howe, basically saying that part of the issue right now is the stock bond correlation. I guess it goes for all risk assets, too, like you were just discussing, that as long as that correlation is high and they're moving together, you're going to demand a higher term premium because bonds look like stocks right now. What does it mean for you to have this correlation between the two, for bonds not to give you that extra protection? Absolutely. Very difficult for a global portfolio manager to be able to hedge away risks in the portfolio. So obviously you get a few instruments to do that, but it's much harder. So very difficult job, whether you're in equities or fixed income. For example, in fixed income, that role has been played by the dollar. That happened last year and commodities to some extent. And we've seen a reemergence of that tool as a hedging mechanism for portfolios. Now, going back to the correlation argument, uh, it's an important one because that is not fully self-sustaining in the sense the more uh, one way you move in both risky assets and sort of safe assets, so to speak, like, like treasuries, the more it becomes um, controversial in the sense there comes a tipping point where that, that no longer holds true. I, at some point, treasuries do play their sort of risk off uh, type of uh, action as they have in the past. Hmm. Do you think that's where we are now? Do you think that's the, the, the next phase because we have such open-ended risk. I, I, I put it out there yesterday is that it's as if somebody ripped, op ripped open the, the on switch on a vacuum cleaner sucking money into dollars. I know the dollar uh, has had a little bit of a tough run of late, but you are just seeing this haven status of U.S. I suppose it's U.S. King U.S. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, um, certainly in terms of the asymmetry I was referring to earlier. So, for example, in, in treasuries, if you sell off by 100 basis points from here, you could stand to lose a couple of percentage points. But if actually if you rally, you could be making more than 12 percent uh, total return in those bonds. So there's a good asymmetry. And the opposite would be true in, in equities, for example. So certainly there is an argument to be made that that safety net probably is much better now in, in sort of core okay. government bonds. Absolutely. All right. Ella, thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate your time this morning. Ella Hoya there of Newton Investment Management.
Now let's get to some other top stories that are trending on the terminal this morning. Exxon is expected to announce an all-stock bid for shell producer Pioneer today. It'll be worth more than $250 a share. That deal would value Pioneer at $58 billion or more. Now, this would be the largest corporate takeover announced globally this year, Manus. Well, Samsung shares, Danny, they rose today after the company's better-than-expected operating profit. That boosted optimism that the worst may have passed for the chip industry. Samsung posted a 78% decline in the third quarter operating income, smaller than what some of the investors out there have been expected. Now, meanwhile, one of Sam Bankman-Fried's closest associates and former girlfriend, Caroline Ellison, has taken to the stand against him in court, alleging that he directed her to commit crimes that led up to the collapse of FTX. Bloomberg's Shanali Basic filed this report from the New York courthouse. It's a critical moment in the criminal trial of Sam Bankman-Fried, the FTX co-founder that is being accused of defrauding investors. His former girlfriend, Caroline Ellison, who also ran Alameda, the hedge fund firm in question that allegedly siphoned hundreds of millions of dollars from FTX and its customers, she had taken the stand today. Remember, she had pled guilty to criminal charges and is, uh, is cooperating with prosecutors. Ellison said that Bankman Freed had directed her to commit such crimes, and she is further outlining the extent to which FTX and Alameda had cooperated with each other and used customer funds, including the creation of the FTT token, which many retail investors bought into. This is only the second week of a six week trial, and other testimonies could include investor Anthony. Anthony Scaramucci, as well as Sam Bankman Fried's own brother. More to come in this trial. From New York, I'm Shanali Basak for Bloomberg Television. Coming up next, we have an exclusive conversation with the former Israeli Central Bank Governor Karnit Flug as the Bank of Israel works to contain the market fallout from the conflict with Hamas. And later this hour, we're live for the IMF annual meetings in Marrakesh, Morocco, with the Citigroup Chair John Duggan joining Francine Lacroix right here on Bloomberg. This is Israel's 9-11. This is Israel's 9-11. And Israel will do everything to bring our sons and daughters back home. Israel's ambassador to the UN, Gilad Erdan, speaking on Sunday. Joining Danny and I now is Karnit Flug, former governor of the Bank of Israel, vice president of research at the Israel Democracy Institute in Jerusalem. Professor, good morning. Thank you for your time. Uh, we've just played you that line from the UN ambassador that this is Israel's 9-11 moment. You've worn many different uh, caps in Israel. Um, you are in Jerusalem now. How would you define this 9-11 moment for Israel from your perspective? Good morning. Well, I think currently, uh, really, there is a state of shock and terrible sorrow about the horrors that we see on television, the massacre that took place in our communities near the border. And there is a great concern about what's coming. There is a great uncertainty about the unfolding of the war. I would say that the only silver lining is seeing Israel is really mobilized and coming together, volunteering on every front, including to reserve duty. Mm -hmm. So this is really the state of affairs right now and great mm -hmm. uncertainty about what's coming. Yes, I mean, we, we, we have, have to in these moments look to those silver linings sometimes, Professor. And, and look, I, I know you also started your career at the IMF. We're in this moment where the IMF is meeting today in Morocco. What does Israel need, not just uniting the country itself, but from the global community? What is necessary in terms of response and aid? Well, I would say first that right now for Israelis, the state of the economy and the economic consequences are not what is on, on the mind of Israelis. Now, I think what we do need is, uh, is support. I think what we've seen yesterday 
in the speech by President Biden was really heartwarming in terms of uh, the support for Israel at this very, very difficult time on all fronts. We're trying to understand what happens next. I, I don't think anybody really ha has a full grasp of that. We've just had some additional news this morning on, uh, on missiles coming in from Lebanon. There's talk of a full-scale uh, land invasion. I now want you to turn and, and try and put in perspective economically the, the impact. We don't know how long this, uh, this war will endure, but from Israel's perspective, how much risk is there now to the economy? How much risk is there to the outlook? Well, if we look back at uh, previous uh, um, wars, you know, the economy will probably uh, have a big blow, but at least in the past, it had recovered very, uh, I would say, rapidly and strongly. Uh, but of course, uh, the extent of the damage to the economy will depend on how things unfold and how long this war uh, will be and how broad it will be. So we will see definitely a very sharp decline in some sectors. Uh, first of all, tourism, private consumption, investment, and some of these effects are prolonged. Uh, so, uh, you know, if we look at back mm -hmm. at the, the Second Lebanon War, uh, there was a very sharp decline in the last quarter of 2006, but then a, an mm -hmm. as strong a recovery by the next quarter. But it's very hard to say, you know, whether what we're going to go through now will be of the same order of magnitude. The, the number of reservists that have been uh, drafted is uh, much, much Indeed. large. And we don't know right. the scale of the war that is coming. So uh, to that Maybe. point, Professor, we have seen, uh, seen of course, the shekel was somewhat stabilized from the action of the central bank, but there were credit default swaps which spiked. Last year with Bloomberg, you spoke to Manus. You warned about the credit rating with the judiciary upheaval. Is the credit rating now even severely more under threat with now Israel at war? It's very hard to say because on the one hand, I think the, my, my guess is that the judiciary reform is off the table now. So in that sense, that risk is over. But obviously the geopolitical risk seems to have intensified. So it's very hard to say how the, what would be the reaction of the credit rating agencies. I have to say though that uh, our financial institutions have been uh, have exhibited uh, resilience over the last two significant shocks. They're very uh, well capitalized. They're very tightly regulated. So I think in in terms of financial stability, uh, uh, we are okay. And also, I think the way the central bank reacted, uh, it has demonstrated that it has the ability to really react uh, swiftly mm -hmm. to the shock and to ensure the functioning of all markets. So in that sense, I think um, we are okay in terms of the financial markets and financial developments. Professor, uh, can we just pick up on that? The central bank obviously defended the currency. I, I think in this, not I think, in their statement, they said that they who had sold as much as $30 billion. Now, we don't have the final number. That's no small amount for an economy at the size of Israel. I know there's nearly 200 billion of reserves. My question to you is, you said that they acted well and, and, and held the defense of the currency. Do you think they're gonna have to do considerably more intervention than that? Will the market test? If there's a full-scale ground invasion, if there is a serious escalation, as Hezbollah claims that they have fired uh, on Israel, if there's a major escalation, do you think that they will have to intervene again in size? Well, they said that they will sell up to $30 billion. That's a huge amount for the market. And I think that is uh, that was enough to calm the market. And I'm sure, given the size of our uh, reserves, I think that if the, it, there will be a necessity for more, they will do more. They said also that they're willing to inject liquidity mm -hmm. uh, uh, of $15 billion. So I think 
it should be enough. And if there is more mm. needed, I think we've seen that actually the uh, just the announcement was uh, uh, enough in order to calm the market, the foreign exchange market. With that in mind, you talk about the swap. You talk about the swap. Fifteen billion dollars of swap mechanisms have been created, uh, Professor. I suppose what goes through Danny and I's mind is that's a reassurance. Mm -hmm. In times of high crisis, swap lines are incredibly important. How much more detail do you want, or does the market need, in terms of the Fed's participation in these swap lines, or what additional swap lines are available globally? Is that is that a psychological defence that can be bolstered? I think that. Uh... It's not necessary for the moment. I think, as you mentioned, that there are $200 billion of reserves. It's a, a huge amount that can really uh, right. be sufficient. And I think the market, again, the reaction of the market shows that it, uh, just the announcement was enough to calm the market. Professor Flug, Earlier in the year, we did have those in the right-wing government that did assail the current Bank of Israel gover governor, Amir Yaron. His term comes to an end in December. How important is it in this moment of unknowingness, of war, of necessary stability that he stays on? I very much hope he stays on. I think that would be the best demonstration that the government wants a strong and independent central bank. So I think that could be a very important step to demonstrate that. There's also been discussion at the political level uh, that a coalition needs to be built. How important is it for the country and for uh, continuity, stability, confidence that, that a coalition government is formed? Is it something that you would you would vouch for, call for support? I think generally unity at this very difficult time is uh, called for, but I won't get uh, any further into that. Fair enough. Now, you, you, you did mention some of the concerns when it comes to the economic impact. Again, just when we're trying to understand the contours and the natures of it, you, there were concerns on FDI already previ previously to this. Again, concerns about what's happening with some of the government, some of the judiciary reforms. How crucial is that FDI conversation right now? Well, I think it's hard to, to think about it right now. We're in the middle mm. of a crisis, and I think that we will have to see how we come out of it. Uh, again, in the past, the extent of the damage to the economy of a war that has not been long, has not been very severe, but it's very hard to say uh, that uh, the past can teach us about uh, what will happen now, given the uncertainty about the severity, the length, and the contours of this uh, current war. As you look at the landscape, we are in day five. There are escalations around uh, further attacks from from an economic and from a monetary policy point of view what is the biggest risk now I think if looking at the financial stability Israel because of the strengths of our institutions and our uh, our very active central bank I think we're okay I think there may be a longer term damage to the economy. It will depend on the extent and the size and the, the, uh, uh, what happens uh, in terms of the war, but also on the reaction of the government uh, later on. I think in the moment it has to allocate all the necessary resources to finance the war and to finance the reconstruction and compensating people. And as soon as the, uh, this is over, I think the question would be where we're going from there. But we're not yet at this stage uh, asking these questions. Professor Flug, we, we know that this is a moment of, of hardship and heartbreak, and we really appreciate your time with us today. That's Karnit Flug, former governor of the Bank of Israel. Thank you so much. All right. As we take an overall step, a step back from this, the concerns are indeed 
proving to be a haven bid into this market. But it does go further than that. We've had, Manus, a lot of central bank policy comments from Daly, uh, from Logan, of course, who is a hawk herself, saying that the market might have done some of the work for it. So you do see tenure yields coming in about eight basis points. Gold, that is surely proving to be a haven bid up about half a percent while Brent crude drops, Manus. Well, there's no doubt about it. That drop in the bond yields on the back of those new headlines, the alert that Hezbollah uh, claims to have fired a missile into Israel uh, from, uh, from across the border in Lebanon. That brought yields down. Does it bolster the equity story? It's still very, very early to, stay, to say. But what you have got is, again, money flowing in, money flowing into U.S. equities. Uh, and, and with that in mind, Danny, it is the yield drop that gives some sucker to the equity story. As far as Europe is concerned, with one of the best days of 2023 yesterday, Danny, up 2%. We build on that. We're now up 3% mm. in two days. Asia is on a five-day uh, winning streak. So you are just seeing a, a real momentum there. Excuse me, uh, Europe building on yesterday is, is a tenth of 1%. LVMH is also very much in our sight line. Um, the CEO said, look, we can't do 30% growth every year. I mean, wines and spirits dropped by 14%, uh, Danny. So the 2023 gains for LVMH have now been wiped out, Danny. Yeah, and Manus, we're going to head to the IMF shortly. But again, I do think it's remarkable. They're warning about future deficits. 2% of gross domestic products, that's what they expect them to be. That is also something that is weighing on this bond market. Look, this is the, the narrative that was before this war. If you think about it, it was deficits and supply and those were the two biggest I suppose headwinds to Stephen Major's call his bullish call he said mm. I was wrong but I was wrong for all the right reasons all the way up to four percent then five percent so as it stands right now Danny it looks like these bonds are behaving as those hedges in times of sheer terror Right. Well, let's head to Morocco now, where we got those warnings from the IMF meetings. And those meetings are ramping up against a backdrop, as you say, Manus, of escalating global conflict and debt distress. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen spoke earlier on her outlook of the U.S. economy. Um, I'm not saying that a soft landing is an absolutely sure thing, but I do continue to think it's the most likely uh, path. But are there risks to um, this outcome, of course there are, and global shocks are among them. We now go live to the IMF meetings with Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix, where she's standing by with Citigroup's chair. Francine. Yeah, thank you so much. I am delighted to be joined by the chair of Citigroup. He's John Dugan. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. It seems like the world is fractured geopolitics, economically. It's very difficult for leaders to almost get on the same page, to get along and find a solution. After the horrific weekend that we've had and the five days of fighting, what does all of this mean for a big global bank like Citigroup? Well, first of all, uh it means we focus most on our people in the ground in Israel, the senseless act of violence by the terrorists. Um, and our hearts go out to our people, and we stand by our people. Thankfully, they're all safe right now. Um, but that is our biggest, most important focus. And of course, we're monitoring and continuing to serve our clients. But it's our people on the ground that are first and foremost. Could it change, actually, the, the world economy? as we see this potentially escalating? Well, we certainly hope not. We're watching it closely. And of course, it's already affected oil prices and commodity prices. <clears throat> but I think we're all just going to have to see how much this expands or not over time. Um, we are in the ground in the region and uh, other places in the world. And so far, it is pretty contained to where, it is, where the conflict has been. And uh, that's certainly what we hope continues. John, when you look at what your CEO has been putting in place, the restructuring, the kind of the, the big changes yes. that Citigroup is, is going through, where do you end up in one, two years in terms of the bank? So this is something that uh, Jane has been very thoughtful about and decisive since her very first time on the job. We had our investor day very soon after she started and really laid out this vision for simplifying the bank. It had already been on a path like that, mm -hmm. but to really much more simplify the bank and to do starting out with divestitures of our non-U.S. consumer businesses, which we had all, all over the world, particularly in Asia, and that's well along now. 
and then secondly in spending a good bit of time transforming our risk and controls and the operations and technology supporting them mm -hmm. um, and really getting that underway and this is the, what I would describe as the third leg of that stool of change to simplify the company and it follows from the other two so for example by getting rid of and having divesting all these non US consumer businesses right. we don't need the same significant geographic managerial layers that otherwise were there so it's getting rid of those um, and likewise bringing the some core businesses closer to Jane so in yeah. two years and I'm getting I am getting to the answer to your question um, in a couple of years I think we believe it'll be a much simpler bank right. um, our expenses will go down our revenues will go up as a result of being simpler for simpler and I think you'll really Despite this great investment in what we're doing in the transformation, those costs will begin starting to come down at is the end a, of next year. Is there a little bit of a bumpy road? I know you've also, for example, put, put you know sold a, a big chunk of a uh, China unit to HSBC. Does that impact your ability to service clients in, no. in the shorter term? No, not at all. Um, in fact, that's a very smooth transition that we're going through. And we, these we've had now coming on nine closings of non-US consumer businesses. I'm pleased to say those have all gone very smoothly um, and we've gotten good premiums for the ones that have closed and then in some other cases we've had to do, engage in wind downs of the business. China's one of them but this marks the ability to smoothly sell a chunk of the business so I'd say all of that's going very well and our business that remains behind which is our core institutional business that we have all over the world that's operating very smoothly and this is not, in fact, it's making it easier uh, rather than more difficult. But because of the changes in restructuring, do you have a final number of job cuts? No, no, we don't. I think uh, one of the interesting things about Jane is she's quite decisive about the direction she wants to go, but she's also very specific about doing it in the right sequence. Mm -hmm. This is not about hitting a number. It's about making sure we get the roles right to simplify the company, to, to get the most efficient business that we can get out of this. Those numbers will come over time, but they're going to, they're, we're not targeting a particular number at this time. So because of ch changing U.S. regulation, Basel, again, what are some of the changes that, that you'll have to go through? Well, the most significant thing with Basel and what's going on in the United St States is a proposal to significantly increase capital requirements for the largest banks that I will say somewhat bizarrely is a response to problems that happened with regional banks in March. Um, we believe that it is an unwarranted proposed increase and not only because it causes us to have to hold more capital but we believe it really will have a material impact on the amount of lending that US companies can do generally which is not a good thing when the economy is in more or less a precarious position even though remarkably resilient and it also pushes more activity lending and inter financial intermediation out of the banking system and into non-banks and we don't think that's a good thing we don't think it's a necessary thing uh, our banks our largest banks including city are very strong from a safety and soundness perspective in terms of capital levels liquidity levels and this is just unwarranted to have this huge excess amount of capital what are Citigroup's own relationships with regulators, um, of course, given what's happened uh, a couple of years ago with some of the consent orders? Uh, I, you know, look, uh, I think we spend a lot of time trying to maintain a very constructive relationship with our regulators. Um, and I think, uh, I can't put words into, into their mouths, but I think they believe we are doing our utmost to comply with the rules and the consent orders that we're operating under. But ultimately, what they want to see and what we must deliver are results, execution results. We believe we are, and people will see that over time, but that's really what the core of the relationship is about. You see a, a lot of volatile markets. You see the cost of credit going up. There's worries about financial conditions getting even tighter. Is there anything that, that you see as, as odd in terms of market behavior right now or something that you worry about? Um, you know, from our position, I think we feel pretty good about our risk profile and the mm -hmm. amount of capital and liquidity we have on the one hand and the risks that we choose to take, which are really pretty prudent at this point. We're not heavily exposed to the commercial real estate business. We did not have uh, interest rate sensitivity that caused us to lose a lot of money when rates went up significantly. 
So I think we as a bank are positioned really quite well. Mm -hmm. But of course, we're always watching markets. We see what's going on in the 10-year treasury going up to at significant levels. And we watch our credit card portfolio, which is enormous, for signs of what will happen to the consumer. We're seeing some cracks in the spending levels, and yet still very robust spending levels. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't say there's anything extraordinary at the moment, but we, of course, are watching. John, thank you so much for your time today. That was, of course, John Dugan, the chair of Citigroup. With that, I'm going to send it back to you, Madison, New York, and we'll have plenty more throughout the day here in Marrakesh, Morocco. Francine, thank you. Insightful indeed. An enormous credit card portfolio, uh, and there are a few cracks, but nothing seismic. Francine Lacroix on the ground in Marrakesh at the IMF meetings in Morocco. Coming up with Danny and I, the next conversation. And Katrin Peterson, senior investment strategist at BlackRock Institute. What do the bond moves mean for Anne Katrin? Is it a vulnerability or something more significant in the bond markets? Right here on Bloomberg Brief. This is Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger in London alongside Manus Cranny in New York. Manus, I want to show you what the 10-year yield has done so far this week. Of course, we've only had two days of cash trading, but we have seen it decline 24 basis points from that peak on Friday. We had that hot jobs number followed by dovish Fed speak saying that the market had done some of the work for them. And you can see recently over the past two hours, you did have this other big drop in 10-year yields, about nine basis points today with mm -hmm. fears of escalation in the war between Hamas and Israel percolating through this market. Let's try to make sense of it all. Joining us now is Ann Katrin Peterson, Senior Investment Strategist at BlackRock Investment Institute. Ann Katrin, you look at the 10-year today, again, a move lower of about nine basis points. How do you dissect what from that trend is coming from just a haven bid versus an actual change in Fed discourse? Yeah, I think the latest moves are really interesting and it's important to dissect exactly what has happened because this year round the surge in bond yields, particularly following the summer months, has been driven um, much more by monetary policy expectations than by term premium. And we do think that generally the risk of holding uh, long-term treasury bonds um, there still is some room for term premium to move higher given the uncertain fiscal policy outlook, also given the current um, uncertain um, outlook um, in the Middle East, which could trigger cost pressures, inflationary um, pressures, and also given the fact that the Fed so far has been engaging in quantitative tightening um, while U.S. issuance is high. But uh, nevertheless, when we dissect these two factors, there is more room to run on the term premium fund. However, when it comes to the monetary policy expectations, the high for longer environment has been priced following the summer months. And here the Fed dovish comments come into play and could motivate investors to turn into the longer term uh, bond market. And Catherine, good morning. It's Madison, New York. It's interesting. You chime with one of the most read stories, which is McCormick over at City saying, even though term premium has gone above zero, it's only at the bottom of the range. So do you expect a much bigger move? How, how much bigger a move do you expect? in term premium before you would shift from your underweight long term US government bonds which is a high conviction for you so how much richer does it need to get before you will shift yeah that's an important um, question Manus and I think we need to uh, differentiate here between our tactical position our tactical long held underweight in US treasuries which has served us well given the rise yep. in surging uh, yields and then the more strategic view um, given the more, more strategically, the term premium has more room to rise um, historically, um, just based on historic moves, about 100 basis points or so, could be within the realms of possibilities. However, then, more tactically, the focus seems to now be shifting more towards, uh, towards the Fed um, shifting tone, and this mm -hmm. could tactically mean that the next move is not doubling up the underweight mm -hmm. on the long end US studies, however, um, then rather going towards neutral. And let me also um, highlight that in European government bonds, so Euro area government bonds like 10 year bonds and also UK girls, right. we have become more constructive on duration uh, since summer. Huh. Okay, so in that environment, I just have to wonder 
How much potential upset is there when the data comes in? Because the Fed still, as they always say they have been, is data dependent. We're going to get CPI this week. Is there a big risk, given positioning, given the volatility we've seen, that that could upset the apple cart once again? Yeah, so um, it is important uh, to know that inflation has um, progressed this year. So some disinflation has been um, observed. However, this is resolving pandemic-related mismatches, uh, mismatches in services and product markets and also on the labor market. So, for example, on the labor market, what has been happening is uh, rehiring dynamics um, post-pandemic. So uh, looking forward into next year, we think that U.S. inflation could be put on a roller coaster mm. ride, given that um, US, um, uh, US, the U.S. working population is aging and uh, hence there might be some labor shortages coming to the forefront again. So we do see some more volatile and more persistent inflation picture that is currently priced, hence our view that the term mm. premium might rise. I, and I like that sort of uh, top line that you've got, which is hold on tight uh, because of this roller coaster in, in inflation that's going to come. What, what I really want to try and understand is what is it that drives the, the sort of the next swing, the second round effect? Is it the energy impact, which obviously war, we are now firmly at war and we don't know the duration of that? Or is it higher and more enduring structural inflation, as Larry Fink said to Danny a couple of weeks ago, it's embedded. And that's about wages, isn't it, anne Catherine? Yes, so in the shorter term, it's exactly what you say, the um, energy costs, which could be related to a, another jump in um, oil prices, um, depending on how the tragic conflict evolves. But then longer term, what, what uh, really will put inflation at a higher level are more structural forces at play, which we also like to call mega forces. And one of them is demographics that I talked about already. Mm -hmm. So the U.S. Um, aging into um, yes, work for, workforce aging into retirement. Another one is the low carbon transition, which will again, for a, on a longer term horizon, mean higher energy um, costs. And Catherine, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining me this morning, and Catherine Peterson there from BlackRock. Now, coming up, we're going to have a look at some of the market-moving events to watch throughout the day. But first, let me show you what your markets are doing. S&P 500 futures continue to march higher after yesterday, gaining about half a percent. The dollar slightly weakens. Again, it is that bid into the 10-year that's caught us all by surprise, down about nine basis points off the back of heightened geopolitical tensions, the heightened war and fears of escalation. But strangely, crude coming down in that environment, $85 a barrel. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger in London. Manish Cranny is in New York. Let's get you set up for your trading day with a look at what is ahead. We're going to be getting U.S. PPI data. That comes in at 8.30 a.m. Eastern. It will be followed by more Fed speak and Fed minutes. Those will be published at 2 p.m. Of course, they might not capture some of the dovish turns we've gotten over the past few days. Now, this evening, the House will hold the speaker election. The outcome of this contest could determine the fate of the next round of aid for Ukraine, as well as the likelihood of another government shutdown. And Birkenstock makes its trading day on the New York Stock Exchange. The latest IPO will test investor demand for risk amid increasingly uncertain times. Manis, a little birdie told me you were outside the Dior shop yesterday. Did yeah. you see any uh, Dior Birkenstocks? Did you buy any well, it, Dior Birkenstocks? It's homage for you, Danny. They've got a pretty magnificent uh, sort of frontal here. Uh, but you got to say, I was looking for the $1,000 Birkenstocks. I had, I had, I had the <laughs> Amex with me and I was going to get, get Danny a little, a little gift. I mean, 46 bucks a share. No, don't worry, I'm not getting you any gifts. 46 bucks a share, maybe a nine <laughs> billion dollar valuation. Do you have any Birkenstocks? That's the that's the question. I bet you've got Dior Birkenstocks. I do, but I feel like I should say I don't because clearly you're not getting me any gifts, and I'm kind of sad now, Manis. Hey, yeah, you know what? But it, it, you know, you look at that IPO; it's the fourth biggest this year, and then you look at Louis Vuitton. Yeah. This year's gains completely wiped out. Yeah, and of course, uh, our Nose Family Office, part of the company that owns Birkenstock, and we'll be IPOing in. All right, that's it for us at Bloomberg Brief. Surveillance is ahead.